Good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our Grand Rounds. I think today is a special topic. We usually don't think about much pericardial disease. We always think inside the pericardium. Uh, it's a good idea to think about that, and uh, because there are some conditions, certainly, that are clinically very important. And nowadays, uh, imaging modalities are crucial, really, in evaluating pericardial diseases. So we have a treat today with two of our stellar faculty, Dr. Faisal Nabi and Dr. Chang, who will enlighten us as to what the role of imaging, be it CT, echo, or MRI, in assessing pericardial diseases. Both of them do not need any introduction. Uh, both of them actually are very special in our faculty because they are trained in multimodality. So it's not only echo and NUC and CT. Actually, Dr. Nabi is has the distinction of having basically level three in all four modalities, and Dr. Chang almost similarly without MRI. And uh, we're really uh, glad to have them. Both of them are very involved in research and have made their name in, uh, in this field and many others. So without further ado, Dr. Nabi will start, and Dr. Chang soon will, will join us. Okay, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Slagby. Thank you for leaving your spring breaks to come today. <laughs> All right, so uh, the topic that will be discussed this morning is advanced imaging of pericardial disease. And I'm just going to get right to it because we've got two speakers and um, only probably 50, 55 minutes to go. So just a brief introduction into pericardial disease. Um, as all of you all know, this is really a w very common worldwide disease. It's a spectrum of disorders which can present as inflammatory conditions such as acute to chronic pericarditis, pericardial effusions, all, which could present all the way, you know, presenting with symptoms of tamponade, to pericardial masses, which include tumors, cysts, and diverticuli. These conditions are an important cause of morbidity and mortality and have variable symptom onset, which includes chest pain, shortness of breath, ascites, leg swelling, and hypotension. And those of you all who have treated these conditions know that sometimes it can be very difficult to evaluate. An accurate diagnosis frequently requires a combination of an, a physical examination, a medical history, good imaging, and frequently, in, in addition, invasive hemodynamic measurements. Um, you should know when it comes to non-invasive evaluation, really echocardiogram is the first line test. And there's many very good reasons for this. And, and simply, you know, it provides us tremendous uh, view of anatomy and the corresponding physiology that goes along with it. But of course, you know, uh, we won't dwell on, but there are limitations to this technique. And um, a lot of you all know these limitations, which include, you know, really having limited windows to see the heart. It can be difficult in certain groups of patients and really does not have any ability for tissue characterization. So this is really where, these, uh, where the techniques of cardiac CT and cardiac MRI uh, really come into play. And I, I hope you'll appreciate that really today in 2016, both these techniques are an integral part of the modern management of cardiovascular, most cardiovascular conditions. And this includes pericardial disease. And this is really because of the unprecedented ability to now view the heart and its corresponding function. These techniques have an unrestricted field of view. They, you can uh, tremendous uh, spatial resolution and an ability to free, um, uh, choose any imaging plane you would like to see. So, um, you know, I think for the purposes of this talk, um, we will be focusing really on the strengths of cardiac CT and cardiac MRI. Dr. Chang will be going over in detail the strengths of CT and also answering all your questions at the end. And my role will be to, um, to tell you all how the specific strengths of cardiac MRI. And I hope during the talk you will appreciate the outstanding ability for it to show you anatomy, give you physiological information, the superior tissue characterization that it has, and really also the only technique we have to assess pericardial inflammation. 
So the goals of Grand Rounds, therefore, are really for you as individual practitioners to develop familiarity with CVMR and CTS imaging modalities for pericardial disease. And also, I hope to show you how an integrated multimodality approach may provide incremental value to your patient. So hopefully, we will answer through a case-based approach how patients with a which patients should, with a complete transthoracic echo should go on to these advanced imaging techniques and how the results of these imaging techniques may influence your subsequent management. So we'll just begin with our first case. I have about six cases, but really lumped into three different large groups. Uh, the first case is a 44-year-old male obese plumber who presents to the eject, uh, emergency department with progressive right-sided substernal and sharp chest pain for the past two months. He reports it's worse with inspiration and it's associated with increasing now shortness of breath. It's partially relieved with sitting upright and he's noted that he does get relief with NSAIDs, which his primary care physician prescribed. However, it has been now increasing to the point, he almost describes it as 10 out of 10, to where he's unable to go to work and he's also now noted onset of fevers. On physical exam, his vital signs were stable. Uh, no friction rub was reportedly heard. There were no evidence of congestive heart failure, but he was noted to be dyspneic with speaking. His labs demonstrated a mildly elevated white count, but no other significant abnormality. Here is his EKG, and uh, for the sake of time, I will sh point out the salient features. I hope you'll appreciate there was these diffuse, mild, maybe half a millimeter to one millimeter S diffuse ST segment elevations, and correspondingly, you'll see in just a few leads, PR segment depressions. If we look at his chest x-ray that was obtained in the emergency department, I hope you'll appreciate that compared to his baseline, the cardiac silhouette was markedly enlarged. So I think all of us, if we're thinking about what we would do next, you know, I think all of us would definitely, the next step would be to go ahead and get an echocardiogram. Um, but, you know, this was the emergency department, and they felt it was important to rule out a pulmonary embolism. So uh, he got a CAT scan. And um, these are the images, and, uh, you know, there was no pulmonary embolism found, but there was a large circumferential pericardial effusion that was seen as well as small bilateral pleural effusions. He eventually did go on to get a, a transthoracic echocardiogram. And um, I hope you'll, and I'll, I'll again point out some salient features. What you'll see is normal biventricular function and a clear space surrounding the heart, which was indicative of at least a moderate, per, uh, moderate pericardial effusion. You'll have to take my word for it on many uh, different views. There was no evidence of chamber collapse. In light of the pericardial effusion, further physiological assessments by Doppler were done to determine whether there was any evidence of elevated intrapericardial pressures. This included looking at um, the AV valve inflow velocities and, and oh, tricuspid valve, there was no variation in velocities. However, there was some indication that maybe on the mitral side, you know, there was some change in his um, um, inflow velocities with respiration. Further uh, data that was provided by our Doppler included good forward cardiac output um, without any evidence of uh, pulses paradoxus and as well as normal systemic venous pressures as indicated by this, um, uh, the images of the IVC and hepatic vein Doppler. So our working diagnosis at this time was a d diagnosis of acute pericarditis with moderate pericardial effusion and, you know, a question mark of whether there was elevated intrapericardial pressures. There was a little bit of respiratory variation across the mitral valve, but systemic pressures seemed all right, and forward flow was preserved. So um, I'll just briefly go over his hospital course. Uh, this patient, because of the severity of symptoms, was admitted to the hospital um, and started on high-dose NSAIDs. By this time, other lab work was starting to come in. His ESR and his CRP were all elevated, as would probably be expected. However, during the course of his hospitalization, unfortunately, his fevers and pains continued. And um, at this time, further workup was undertaken. Colchicine was added. Uh, 
other routine cultures uh, were taken to figure out why he may be having fevers, and other serologies uh, and, um, uh, and uh, connective tissue disease um, uh, uh, serologies were ordered and actually all came back negative, looking for other causes for why this gentleman may have pericarditis. Unfortunately, as the days went on, uh, really, we, despite uh, dual therapy, there was really no improvement of his symptoms. His fevers and pains continued. Um, and uh, by this time, you know, the patient did, did look visibly ill, although his hemodynamics continued to remain stable. So, um, you know, our, our diagnosis here at this time was acute pericarditis with persistent fevers and a failure to respond to therapy. And so, um, although we don't have an audio response system, I just want you all to think what, as a practitioner, you would do next. And I've thrown out some, you know, um, potential etiologies maybe that, you know, most of us would consider, uh, and I'm sure there may be other choices that physicians would think about as well. But, you know, would you go ahead and give this more time? Would you consider now adding further anti-inflammatories? You know, would you consider imaging, further imaging, to figure out what's going on? Or would you simply now take this patient and go ahead and tap the fluid and see what's going on? So, you know, this is an imaging talk, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, I can tell you, you know, we went ahead and proceeded with a cardiac MRI. But hopefully in the next few slides, I'll show you why. I would have drained the blood. I would have drained the blood. I would have drained the blood. Okay. Hopefully, I hope, I hope some of my upcoming slides will help maybe show where, you know, Im further imaging may have helped with this patient. It's very reasonable. <laughs> okay. Um, let me get these images back. All right. So here is his cardiac MRI. Okay, good. And um, I'll just give you a few brief seconds to, to take a look at the images and see what you think. But um, I, you know, and I'll, I'll expand on some of these salient features that we uh, will start seeing. But I hope so, most of y'all will appreciate that... Okay. Okay. I hope you all will appreciate that, yes, there was that small pericardial effusion that we see, which is this, you know, these bright um, uh, fluid layer we see here. But if you look around the heart, you'll see a markedly thick stripe here, which is really uh, the pericardium. And, you know, in the right cl clinical uh, setting, you know, this pericardial thickening combined with an effusion is suggestive of acute pericarditis by cardiac MRI. But let's go a little bit into how cardiac MRI can help. Well, first of all, we have, an un, we have an amazing ability to see the pericardium. I hope you remember from the transthoracic images, you know, it's very difficult to see the pericardium. With CMR, identifying the pericardium is very easy. We have a particular sequence called T1-weighted sequences where we're able to visualize the pericardium. Notice how thin the pericardium generally is, this, this just curvilinear line. But on these images, you can notice how markedly thick the pericardium appears. The other big benefit of CMR is that you have no problem differentiating a small pericardial effusion from uh, pericardial thickness, which frequently um, it can be difficult with cardiac CT. Furthermore, um, uh, CMR, because of its wild field, large field of view, we get a very good idea of the pericardial effusion itself. And I'm showing you, this is our patient. This was another patient I'll just get to. But you can see here that this effusion is actually loculated. If you look at the effusion itself, notice how dark it appears compared to this simple transudate over here. Furthermore, you can see that it has, it's, um, it has a lot of septations in there, debris. All of this points to that this is a complex pericardial effusion and based on tissue characteristics that we use with our T1 and, and uh, gradient echo images, 
that this is more than likely an exudative process that we're seeing. Other interesting findings that we noticed on this patient were this patient was now having evidence for constrictive physiology. And I'll go a little bit more into this in our next uh, uh, case. But in brief, I hope you'll appreciate there's a diastolic septal uh, shutter there, which shows the close ventricular interaction now that this heart has um, uh, when it's confined by a very thick pericardium. And on these real-time cine free breathing techniques, I hope you'll appreciate the movement of the septum with respiration. And I know it can be difficult sometimes when these movies are playing, but just on a still image here with inspiration, you can see movement of the interventricular septum towards the LV. Because this is a technique with a large field of view, you can make other diagnoses. In this particular patient, he had bilateral pleural effusions of fair size. And, and um, of course, so uh, with CMR, these were just, you know, the strengths of it based on an anatomical and physiological assessment. The next major um, um, you know, the particular strength of CMR is, of course, its tissue characterization. Now, most of y'all are familiar with its tissue characterization in the setting of SCAR, looking for, uh, in, in, in for cases of viability. And this is just those particular images may, which you have been used to seeing with the normal myocardium pierce black, indicating there's no uh, infiltration of any disease process or no scarring of this ventricle. But where this can be very helpful is CMR can help you identify concomitant myocarditis. Take a look at this particular case, which presented with actually very similar symptoms and very similar um, uh, findings on the CINE images. But if you look closely at the delayed hyperenhancement images here at the mid anterior wall, you can see hyperenhancement of that wall indicating a concomitant myocarditis. And as would be no surprise, as this case, as some of our um, esteemed colleagues have noted, that you know, in this particular case, there was no delayed hyperenhancement of the myocardium, but there was delayed hyperenhancement of the pericardium. And um, I, this is just a particular sequence that we use. It's a long, complicated name. But the point of it is that you will see diffuse hyperenhancement of this thickened pericardium all circumferentially around the heart. And so, and more slides about this to come, but this hyperenhancement of the pericardium is pretty much histological confirmation of active inflam inflammation going on. So, at this time, based on our um, imaging that we produced with CMR, you know, we came up with, a, I think our diagnosis may have changed a little bit to now where we would say, you know, really correctly that this patient has an acute loculated effusive constrictive pericarditis with active pericardial inflammation. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. That's exactly why I kind of presented this case. Uh, I, I think, you know, either this disease was progressing so rapidly, and so a lot of these changes, although the imaging was very close with the, within days with it, each other, but, I, you know, I also felt you, we were, you know, some of the features that were appreciated were not appreciated with echocardiography in this, in this particular case. So, um, as, as our distinguished colleagues mentioned, you know, I, rightfully so, you know, I, I think at this point the physicians made a clinical decision based on their physical findings, their talking to the patient and the imaging findings that we're going to go ahead and go ahead and, and um, obtain fluid on this patient. Now, because it was loculated anteriorly and laterally, this patient was sent for a surgical uh, drain uh, and, and pericardial biopsy. 
and about 125 cc's of serosanguinous fluid was drained. Uh, no lymphocytes were seen. Uh, no, you know, the cultures were sent. There was no malignancy. Biopsy was also performed, and he had drainage of his pleural fluid as well. And, um, and I, I will tell you, uh, to save time, that, um, you know, uh, correctly so, as the clinicians in the audience also had, you know, uh, may have uh, uh, said in the beginning, that this was a very complicated case, and actually cultures here in this particular patient did come back positive for a multimicrobial uh, process. And so our final diagnosis on this gentleman was effusive constrictive infective pericarditis. Um, I can tell you uh, uh, another area where CMR can potentially help you, and there will be more on this in the upcoming slides. This patient was uh, treated um, with, of course, uh, a, a prolonged period of antibiotics, as well as anti-inflammatories uh, to help with the inflammation and constrictive physiology that was seen. And this is his CMR at three months. Okay. Um, mark my word for it. I, I know we have limited time here, but I hope you'll see that the pericardial thickness has markedly resolved. There is no further pericardial diffusion. And um, um, the constrictive physiology that we had noted originally has also completely resolved. However, what was interesting, despite three months of treatment um, uh, with antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, if you looked at his late gadolinium enhancement images, I hope you'll appreciate there were still significant pericardial inflammation present on this uh, gentleman's uh, late gadolinium enhanced images. And in this particular case, though, despite the fact that they were now done with antibiotics, they did continue to treat this patient further for, uh, uh, in further time with anti-inflammatories to try to get a control of this inflama inflammatory process they were seeing. Sure. Um, sure. You know, a lot, a lot of your points are well taken. My next case will show us how CMR can show edema and inflammation. But, and a further slide I have is where, where they've actually taken constrictive uh, pericarditis patients and done biopsy on these patients who are operated. This uptake of gadolinium uh, is pretty much pathognomonic for inflammation by histology, demonstrating an infiltration of fibroblasts, neurovascularization, and inflammatory infiltrates. Yes, sir. Infective pericarditis. Uh, that's a great question. Cla the classic, what I have read was most of the time these patients have some preceding infection where then is seeded through the bloodstream and gets to the pericardium. Uh, classically, a pneumonia or s something like that, where it's either in direct contiguous relation to the pericardium or can you know, uh, 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 transmit through a bacteremia. And this particular gentleman, you know, we had no, ev no uh, he, by history, he tells us of no you know, uh, severe infection. Although his symptoms were for two months, and during that course, was he, did he have a pneumonia or, you know? Probably what I would do with that 
finally continue on inflammatory therapy, monitoring, hoping that three months later, I'll see a further reduction in uptake, and then I can scaper down my, 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 my I mean, that, it's a leap of faith because there's no real clinical trial showing that yet. Hopefully, there will. But I just don't want the fellow to think now when they go into practice that they need to wait 48 hours to get a PMI, and the guy is not looking well, and he's going to go down with it. That's just not the right answer. Dr. Kieran, colleagues completely agree. Uh, our, my purpose of these, uh, this particular presentation was really just to show that if you are on the fence, how imaging may be able to help you. But yes, clinically, I completely agree with you, sir. So based on, and there's you know, few and far guidelines on this. There's really no randomized trials. This is all expert opinion. When it comes to acute pericarditis, when should you consider uh, ec um, as, uh, advanced imaging, specifically CMR? Um, and the recommendations are patients who have either equivocal echoes or those who run a complicated course, such as those who have high-risk features, such as our individual case where we had a fever, an indolent course, and failure to respond to therapy, and those where, where you want to help identify complications, and those patients who may have recurrent pericarditis or constrictive features where you can look at pericardial information, uh, uh, inflammation, to assess um, uh, therapy and monitor response to therapy. So uh, let me jump to the second uh, group of cases. Uh, this is a 47-year-old female with a past medical history of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, who has a host of he hematological issues, such as antithrombin-3 deficiency, antiphospholipid antibodies, and factor V Leiden, denies a history of rheumatoid arthritis or lupus who presents to the emergency department, this time seven-month history of progressive dyspneonic, uh, dyspneonic exertion, lower extremity edema, fatigue, and right upper quadrant pain. The physical exam was a positive JVP, which increased with inspiration. Uh, there was no rub appreciated. The liver felt big, and the patient had lower extremity edema. Initial labs were normal. Um, here are the transthoracic images with contrast. And um, um, again, I, I chose the contrast images because I hope you'll appreciate that there is a bounce of the septum. Uh, we call this a diastolic septal bounce or diastolic sh shutter. And then you can see the clear black space around the heart, which would be indicative of small circumferential pericardial effusion. Now, um, um, with this particular finding, uh, you know, one of the first things the echo lab does is to you know, look for uh, other physiological findings of constrictive, uh, uh, constrictive physiology. And that includes looking at inflow velocities across the mitral and tricuspid valve. And what we notice on both these um, in, uh, mitral and tricuspid valve inflow velocities is you see a, a restrictive LV and RV diastolic filling pattern, which is the, D, uh, you know, the elevated um, E wave as well as a sharp deceleration time. And you notice respiratory changes in inflow velocities. And this really, um, I hope you'll appreciate, is really the hallmark of uh, constrictive physiology, where you have a dissociation of intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures. And, this is, and, and, and therefore, this ventricular coupling that occurs with respiration. And with inspiration, you, I hope you can appreciate mitral inflow velocities decrease on a beat-to-beat -beat basis, whereas they increase on uh, tricuspid inflow velocities. Furthermore, support to constrictive physiology is normally on tissue Doppler of uh, the medial tissue Doppler, mitral uh, annulus tissue Doppler velocities are generally lower than that of the lateral wall. In this particular case, with constrictive physiology, you'll often see that the medial E prime is larger than the lateral E prime. This is called annulus reversus. And when we do our equation to figure out filling pressures, there's actually a paradoxical relation. There's inverse relationship with filling pressures, and this is called annulus paradoxus. And um, if you will be convinced by these, this image, there was also another aspect, uh, another manifestation of constrictive physiology is the prom prominent hepatic vein diastolic flow reversal upon expiration here marked by these stars. So I hope, you know, I've shown you uh, just a sample by transthoracic echocardiogram 
really of the classic manifestations of constrictive physiology. So uh, we had a diagnosis, I think, of constrictive pericarditis with this case. And again, I had, just want you to think about what you would do next as a clinician for this patient. Would your next step be a pericardiectomy? Or would you consent, consent, perform a confirmatory hemodynamic assessment? Because after all, this is a very big surgery. Or would you just treat these patients with medicines? Or would you consider further imaging? My job is to convince you why maybe further imaging may be a benefit to you. So um, we, of course, went ahead and proceeded with a cardiac MRI on this patient. And um, uh, these are a sequence of CMR images, the long axis views as well as the short axis views. And um, um, in, in the next few slides, I hope I'll to appreciate, uh, show you some of the salient features uh, of that we're noticing. But again, what I'd like you to notice, how well you can see that this heart is just constrained by this very thick pericardium that's running circumferentially. You see enlarged atria. Um, um, you, if your eye is very good and used to seeing this, you may even see a diastolic septal bounce. But we'll get to all of this here in just a bit. So CMR, fantastic tool to see anatomy. If you look very, using our turbo one spin echoes, you can see how well we can see the pericardium. You can see how thick this pericardium is. And really, when it comes to a diagnosis of constrictive physiology, uh, finding a pericardium th greater than four millimeters actually has a very good sensitivity and specificity for constrictive physiology in the right setting. Furthermore, we have other sequences that can um, shed light onto the pericardial myocardial interaction. This is uh, it's called um, uh, real-time uh, myocardial tagging. And basically, uh, you know, what it can show is normally the pericardium and myocardium should be free of each other. But here I hope you'll appreciate there seems to be adherence of the pericardium to the myocardium and uh, um, uh, the immobility of this interface. Um, and then finally, um, you know, with CINE imaging, we can also um, appreciate signs of constrictive physiology. And here, uh, a tip-off, if you'll notice very carefully right here, you'll notice um, uh, what we call this diastolic septal sh bounce or diastolic septal shudder, which is just another manifestation of respiratory ventricular interdependence, which is the pathophysiology, the hallmark of constrict constriction. Uh, as you know, uh, this, uh, this process is defined by a dissociation between intrathoracic and intracardiac pressures uh, with inspiration as uh, uh, pulmonary venous pressures drop and there's an, a, a, a decreased gradient to um, inflow into the left atrium. This results in left filling, uh, a decreased um, mitral valve velocities and left filling of the left ventricle and results in a shift of, um, of the uh, ventricular septum to the left and increased filling on the right. And you can actually see this on these real-time images. This here, the patient is breathing on their own. We're just taking images of the heart. And you can actually see as the diaphragm descends, the, in, the ventricular septum will shift towards the right, and this uh, towards the LV, I'm sorry, and then will reverse itself on expiration. And this is just a still image of that. Uh, we have further techniques similar to echo Doppler now where we can actually assess real-time um, inflow velocities across the AV valves and uh, show respiratory variation across those as well. And of course with CMR you have a tool where you can assess, a, a tool to assess, further tool to assess physiology um, and look for systemic venous hypertension. Here you can see IVC plethora, an IVC that's dilated and non-compressible, as well as signs of elevated systemic venous pressure, which in, in our particular case here showed enlarged RA, bilateral pleural effusions, hep hepatomegaly, as well as ascites. So we've talked about, so how can tissue, again, tissue characterization is really where CMR is unique uh, of all the modalities and, and, and how it can help us. Look, so we've shown you the T1 images, which show you the thickness of the pericardium. This is a little bit about the discussion we just had a little bit earlier. We can actually look for edema, which is, no, which is called T2 imaging. And with T2 imaging, I hope you'll appreciate this, this thick pericardium that you saw on the T1 images is remarkably bright on the T2 images. This 
is really that the pericardium is full of water or edema. And if we go on to our late gadolinium enhancement images, the entire pericardium has taken up contrast, and you can see the remarkable um, 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 uh, contrast uptake and the bright signal you see from the pericardium. So now I ask you, now that you know that this patient has contracted pericarditis, we've shown an active inflammatory uh, inflammation. Would the response that you originally thought of in your mind now be different of how you would manage this patient? So um, this patient was treated with an aggressive um, uh, triple anti-inflammatory anti therapy, including NSAIDs, colchicine, and prednisone. And here's the CMR at six months. Um, and what I, um, I uh, will show you and, ho and also speak to you of is you will appreciate that the pericardium has normalized in size. The septal bounce has completely resolved. We see no respi respi uh, respiratory and ventricular interdependence, and the pericardial effusion has resolved. If we look at the T2 and late, late gadolinium enhancement images, you can see the edema has completely gone. That bright stripe we saw is completely resolved, and the pericardial, the, uh, the delayed hyperenhancement of the pericardium has completely ceased as well. And at this point, the patient was now gradually tapered off his medications. And this is just a quick comparison to show you pre-therapy and post-therapy what this delayed hyperenhancement looked like. Now, what does this mean? So, what does this delayed hyperenhancement mean? So, this was 25 patients with constrictive pericarditis clinically who underwent pericardiectomy. All of them had CMR uh, uh, pre-surgery. Their pericardium was then uh, studied histologically. And what they showed was those patients who had delayed hyperenhancement had more evidence of fibroblasts in the pericardium, more evidence of granulation tissue, more evidence of neurovascularization, more evidence of chronic inflammation, all indicating that this delayed hyperenhancement histologically means that this is an ongoing dynamic inflammatory process. Whereas those pericardiums that did not take up uh, contrast were more fibrotic and calcified. So let me show you, and, and this was another small study, you know, there's not much data out there in the literature with pericardial disease, but 29 patients, constrictive pericarditis, who were treated with anti-inflammatory meds. Uh, 14 of these patients had resolution of their uh, constrictive pericarditis symptoms. When they compared those patients who res uh, resolved their pericarditis compared to those who don't, didn't, what they found was those patients with resolution of their pericarditis had a statistically significant thickening of their pericardium greater than three millimeters, and 93% of them had what was considered to be moderate to severe pericardial hyperenhancement. Um, um, hyper so contrast this constrictive pericarditis case and its management with this case. Same case, uh, different case. Um, uh, here is a patient. Okay, here is the case um, of um, um, a, a patient with AFib, right upper quadrant discomfort, and lower extremity edema. And what you'll hopefully notice is you can almost, you can see this very thick stripe here, which is a very thickened and, as I will show you, calcified pericardium. And you can see how it has constrained the heart. You can actually see these ventricles now taking a tubular form because they're unable to expand fully. So you can actually visualize the constrictive physiology in this particular heart. And, you know, secondary features such as a dilated IVC as well as the ventri respiratory ventricular independence in this case were all present. Notice the T1 and T the T T1, of course, showed the markedly thickened pericardium. Look at it on T2 images. There is no evidence of edema. There is no evidence of uh, an intense signal in the pericardium. Notice the late gadolinium enhancement images. Here's the pericardium. There's no evidence of that bright white stripe that I had shown you in the other cases. Look at this patient's cardiac CT. I hope you'll appreciate that this is extensive, cal cal this is extensive calcific uh, constrictive pericarditis representing end-stage fibrosis and inflammation. And the treatment for this patient is not anti-inflammatories. Rather, it would have been surgery. 
CMR can help us in constrictive pericarditis one other way. This is not a problem as much for imaging as it is for the interventionalist. But here was, another, here was a patient, 65, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with bad right heart symptoms. He was referred to CMR for that to look for uh, whether this uh, pericardial evaluation, whether that could be contributing to his symptoms. Um, right off the bat, I hope you can appreciate that the pericardium is thickened here, and you do get this kind of compressed effect on the RV. Um, but for the sake of time, I'll just jump to our imaging. You can see that the pericardium is markedly thickened. But look what we found on the delayed hyperenhancement images. A little hard to see, but I hope you'll appreciate diffuse hyperenhancement of the myocardium. So really, you know, with, with a technique such as CMR, we don't have difficulty differentiating constriction versus restriction. This patient's symptoms were likely due to an infiltrative process. So when should you consider imaging in chronic pericarditis? Again, recommendations by experts are in patients who have uncertain results or when you want to assess for inflammation in order to find out those patients who are reversible or to monitor response to therapy. Now, the last and final, oh, okay, we're short of time, so I'll really get going here. Um, when looking for cardiac masses, CMR really is a tool of choice for this, not only because you can see the entire heart, but because of its tissue characteristics. We have multiple ways we do tissue characteristics. In this particular case of this apical mass, you can see on T1 it's dark, on T2 it's bright. But more importantly, on first-pass perfusion imaging and contrast enhancement, you see contrast uptake of the, this mass, um, um, which indicates uh, um, that the, this, uh, this contrast enhanced uptake of this mass is considered a tumor. Contrast this, and this has been shown in studies that com where, where they've looked at masses, that whenever you have contrast up uptake of a mass, the point is that this is a tumor. Uh, contrast this to this case. You see this uh, enlarged cardiac silhouette here. You can see this mass next to the heart. On T1, T2, it's dark and then bright, but there's no gadolinium up uptake. This is very consistent with a cyst. Whereas, whereas this other case, you can see on T1 images, it's bright. On T2 images, it's dark. This is, again, no evidence of contrast uptake. This is very consistent with a lipoma. So CMR can be very helpful when it comes to diagnosing masses. Dr. Chang? Oh, OK. Um, well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to rush to the end, so I'll just go through the conclusions a little bit slower. So, um, um, so our conclusions for this talk is really, you know, CMR can be a very powerful complementary tool, not only in determining pericardial morphology, but concomitantly being able to see the physiological effects of the pericardium to the myocardium. And I hope uh, these cases have demonstrated that. Second, CMR has the unique ability to detect pericardial inflammation. Oh. Oh, so why don't you take a, a, a question or two from the audience while Dr. Chang is oh, okay. Are we better in utilization? <laughs> okay. Dr. Chang. I try to do this. Uh, make it short. Yes, yeah, very short. I'm not going to talk about per acute pericarditis. <laughs> sure. Anyway, so rotor CT. Uh, you can see here that uh, when you order a CT, please order a cardiac CT gated. You can see the difference in images between non-gated and gated CT. So first, this is a big, big importance here. Okay, uh, and then the, I'm going to start with actually my conclusion slides. I change it right there. The primary rotor CT is you try to find the localized loculated effusion that you plan to do surgical intervention that you cannot assess well in echo. I'll show you some case. And patient with systemic involvement of pericardium, especially in neoplastic cases or aortic cases, CT actually, not, not specifically for pericardial uh, process, but to uh, fully evaluate the patient before you, you treat the patient. And then the, I think the major role of CT is assessment of uh, calcification in suspected constrictive pericarditis, especially in those patients who you plan to send to surgery. And obviously, uh, congenital lesions, now we're seen by echo, uh, CT could offer a very good assessment. 
just a quick uh, cases here. Uh, patient in dialysis show up after um, a car accident. We showed a breath, as you can see there, a wide open TR, and uh, kind of mass compressing the right atrium right there. Um, sorry about that. So you can see here that uh, CT help you to delineate the structure compressing the right atrium, and this uh, case turned out to be a pericardial hematoma uh, uh, confirmed uh, by uh, surg surgical intervention. And, uh, and, and, and pathology assessment. It was a subacute hematoma. And uh, in this case, kind of helped uh, to understand why the patient had TR probably com uh, compromising the tricuspid apparatus. The patient ended up having uh, post uh, um, uh, annuloplasty and the ring placement. I'm going to skip this. Uh, and tamponade. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, obviously. Uh, XCT doesn't have major role in acute tamponade, but again, if the patient is so stable in, in, a, uh, in a sense that can get a CT and usually by request of a surgeon to know the extent, like in this case a patient who had um, hemodynamic compromise, uh, mild hypotension after a VIBAP placement, uh, ECHO obviously was able to diagnose the presence of uh, uh, pericardial effusion and tamponade as you can see, but uh, to assess the, uh, the involvement of the structure of the bivad uh, uh, was helpful for the surgeon for uh, surgical planning. And this is actually a very interesting case. Uh, it's a, uh, Dr. Laurie's patient. Patient had a pi bypass surgery uh, and went to his cardiology office, was found to have hypotension and passed out in the office and did an echo, uh, stat echo right there in the office to show some effusion and small heart. Uh, patient was sent to the to, sent to Dr. Lowry for urgent surgery. In the OR, the TEE could not find any evidence of effusion. So Dr. Lowry actually has to stop the, the surgery and send the patient down there down to us for, uh, for CT. As you can see, there's a localized effusion involving the posterior and lateral or left ventricle. There's no compromise of the RV, but mostly the localized compromise of the LV. As you can see, this is a gentleman who is, uh, I think, at least six feet, 220 pounds. You can see the heart is very small, underfilled. Uh, IBC is uh, plethoric, dilated. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, this was useful, again, for surgical planning. And uh, Dr. Laurie reviewed the, surg reviewed the CT with us, uh, find out the location, so he was able to go in and find exactly uh, where the effusion is and, and do a window and drainage. I'm going to skip that, and this is a case that we already talked about. Dr. I think Dr. Navi showed this case of a constrictive pericarditis, uh, showing the thickening of the pericardium here. But I think the, most, the major role of uh, CT in patients with suspected pericarditis is this patient uh, to assessment of a calcific lesion, which nowadays can probably represent about 20% of the uh, constrictive pericarditis. As you can see here, patient has history of cons uh, radiation. Uh, presented with CHF, I mean, it, almost entirely hard, and this 3 d rendering is completely uh, uh, encapsulated by the calcium, both the left side and the right side. And, uh, and why, is, why is it important? Besides the diagnosis, I think it's very important for the surgeon to know the extent of the calcification before they go in, and specifically, as the arrow pointed, uh, the intramyocardial involvement of calcific Calcification is extremely important because that could compromise the success of the surgery. Uh, again, but again, for the fellows, I mean, presence of calcium and does not doesn't mean the patient had calcific constrictive pericarditis. So that is this case is a very interesting case. Patient with cystic fibrosis have multiple coronary bronchial fistula and significant extensive calcification pericardial. But as you can see, the heart doesn't look like. Uh, small doesn't look small, and he has he, ha he has no clinical signs of uh, constriction at all. So, presence of calcium, even extensive, doesn't mean the patient has uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis. So, I'm going to skip that. This is a very interesting case again. Um, patient show up with uh, chest pain for two days, positive troponin, and new EKG changes. You can see some ST elevation uh, in the diffusely. Went for the cath emergently, no coronary lesion. But some of the you can, uh, Dr. Um, Kleiman actually was able to see some uh, foreign objects in the, in the fluoroscopy and uh, send the patient for CT. 
confirming the presence of metal objects uh, in the in the heart, in the posterior portion of the heart. I want to show you here, actually, so this metal object is actually partially embedded in the myocardium and protruding into the pericardial space. As you can see, this is a 3D rendering of LV cavity only, so without the myocardium. This is a 3D rendering with the myocardium. So you can see the, uh, the so this is embedded in the myocardium, and, and, and part of it is in the pericardium. That causes myopericarditis, uh, explaining the ECG changes, and also the pet, chest pain and positive troponin. As you can see, the patient has history of IVC filter put in, and uh, he's supposed to have 12 throat, and there's only one, is one of the posterior one is missing. So basically a rupture and embolization of the, of the uh, strut and causing a, uh, myocardial pericarditis, myopericarditis. So maybe they went to the left side. Uh, actually... Yes, and she should have gone from the RV, and we have a case, a young lady actually was embedded in the intraventricular septum. So this case actually worked its way through and to the left side. Okay, so that's what we saw. And last, I'm going to show you a case of, uh, um, I'm going to skip that. Show you a case of um, a congenital lesion. This is a patient of mine, actually. I probably will never see this kind of case again. Uh, normal chest x-ray. She come to me because of the ch chest pain and shoulder breath. Uh, check, you, you can see a check ratio and dilated heart, and pretty much heart was shifted to the left side. And the CT done elsewhere, uh, uh, non-gated CT done elsewhere, showed the heart is completely herniated toward the left. Obviously, one of the other conditions would be pneumothorax, which this patient doesn't have. What happened, happening, this patient has what we call partial congenital absence of pericardium. You can see that where the, the small thin white line that you can see normally is absence in the left side. In the right side, I'm sorry. And the, the, the most specific finding is this for the fellows, that if you see uh, lung tissue in between the big vessel, that's a diagnosis of congenital absence of pericardium because normally there should be pericardial recess there. So that's the most specific finding. And there's about less than 500 cases reported uh, since uh, worldwide. And uh, what's interesting here is, I'm um, sorry, it's not playing. Patient had obviously depressed EF, has mild uh, single vessel disease, got stented. Obviously, EF didn't improve. So uh, this is a case of uh, also uh, LB non-compaction. So it's not unusual that for this patient to have congenital absence of pericardium plus other congenital disease, but as far as I know, this hasn't been cases reported association with LB non-compaction. I think this is quite a uh, convincing case. I think there's no question that this is a non-compaction. Yeah. Okay, um, this eventual CT, obviously, radiation and contrast. This is mostly for advertising slices. I don't see many, most of people know this. So we have this new scanner, super fast. Uh, uh, and uh, we can do uh, cases. This is one of the first cases we did, uh, literally uh, very good image quality, diag very diagnostic. Um, we can achieve in, uh, I think, over half of the cases or even more in stable outpatient, very low radiation, very low contrast dosage. Uh, again, so the main take-home message for the fellows is if you have a patient with any lesion, pericardial lesion that doesn't, fit with the clinical scenario or you have a contradictory finding, uh, CT and MRI are indicated. And for C CT specifically, uh, is, I think is uh, very useful if the, you plan to perform any surgical intervention and CT will help you to guide the therapy and maybe possibly um, uh, for follow-up as well. Anyway, that's all I have. both uh, Dr. Chang and Dr. Nabi for a really wonderful presentation, uh, showing us really the power of current technology in addition to traditional technology to assess pericardial disease, its, its hemodynamic consequences, and hopefully also help us in management of patients. I know it's getting late, and Mike, you probably have Just a question. Just one quick there. clinical comment, uh, again, for the few fellows left. <laughs> you know, one of the best things that we've seen in the last decade is the 
demonstration that anti-inflammatory therapy can cure a lot of constrictive pericarditis. I can tell you, uh, I've been in this business for 40 years. We sent a lot of these people to surgery in the old days that today respond beautifully to anti-inflammatory therapy. So that's a wonderful development. The flip side of that now is when you have the real patient that nothing works and you have to go to surgery, you have to make a lot of phone calls to find a surgeon in the U.S. that can do a, a proper pericardial stripping. So that's the flip of that is that now so few patients need surgery that it's hard to find a surgeon that actually have done them and have the experience to do pericardial stripping. So that's kind of the negative side of it. Still, it's great that, you know, majority of patients now can be treated. And uh, that's one thing that, you know, for you now, you look at it as, oh, my God, no big deal. I can tell you 20 years ago it was a big deal because most of the people ended up in surgery because we had not learned that they could be treated. Well, thank you again, and have a wonderful day.